I'm Jane Hansen, and this week in the arena, dying and end-of-life issues. It's an unthinkable and agonizing ordeal that nearly all of us will have to face knowing a loved one is about to die or even that we are at death's door. The questions, emotions, and decisions that come up during this difficult time are many and we want to address some of them today. Joining us to discuss these heartbreaking issues are Monsignor Kieran Harrington, the Director of Communications for the Diocese of Brooklyn, and two staff members of Calvary Hospital, Nancy D'Agostino, Vice President of Community Patient Services, and Patricia Caffrey, the RN Satellite Administrator at Calvary's Brooklyn campus. Welcome to both of you. And I think first we should talk about exactly what Calvary Hospital is. It is the only one of its kind in the country, Nancy. That's right. Uh, Calvary Hospital is the only uh, acute care hospital long term for individuals who are at the end of life. And it's a, uh, we encompass palliative care uh, as well as uh, acute care within there. And what that means is uh, different from an acute care facility that's more short term, our patients have a longer time that they are hospitalized. And the reason that they come to Calvary is because they're presenting with symptoms and, and other management concerns that need to be addressed at this very crucial part in their, in their life. And it's different than an active treatment kind of a center. Our concentration is on symptom management and promoting quality uh, at the end of life. And Patty, what do you feel like your mission is? Because this is, this is a hard job, in my opinion, to do. Yes, it is, and it, it can be, it can be really very emotionally draining. Um, but for those of us who who do end of life care, for those of us who work at Calvary, there's there's a real commitment in making sure that um, that as somebody goes through this process, which, by the way, is a natural life process. That mm -hmm. we're all going to go through it. Yeah, exactly, and and certainly. It's one of those topics that typically we don't, we do not want to talk about. But for those, for those of us who do end of life care, who do hospice care, palliative care, it really, um, it gives great joy and satisfaction knowing that we've, we've helped somebody who's been suffering, who really doesn't have good quality of life, and and to give them their tools and and hold their hands and you know, just be a presence for them to, to help relieve that suffering and, and... In essence, to have a good death. Exactly. And why is it, Monsignor, that we have such a hard time facing the idea or even the concept of a good death? Well, I mean, typically we, we as Catholics pray for a good death, right? I mean, and we would think about the Secret Heart Novena very often was what people are praying for, right? That they would have a good death. And, and I think that the reason is is because uh, I mean, it really goes to a spiritual point of view that uh, that if we we want to be with God in heaven, and we know that that when we're sick, uh, and then when we're suffering, that's the potential for despair. Mm -hmm. And and this is really a challenge that you can despair when you're in the midst of when you're in the throes of suffering, and uh, when you feel abandoned, mm -hmm. and you feel there is no one there, and you're asking the question, why is God doing this to me? And so uh, a good death uh, enables us to see how somehow that our suffering has meaning. You know, that we suffer, that we suffer is, is just a result of being human. Mm -hmm. uh, how we suffer is what makes us a Christian. Mm -hmm. And we su seek to suffer as Christ suffered on the cross. So just because a person suffers doesn't make them any better or any holier. Uh, what makes a person holy is, is that somehow there is a meaning in the midst of the suffering. And we can identify in our suffering uh, with the sufferings of Christ, and hopefully that suffering then can be redemptive. But still, we are still very reluctant to deal with this subject, especially ahead of time. You said something earlier about uh, when we were chatting beforehand about people imagine what their death would be like. Mm -hmm. How, mm -hmm. I've never imagined what my death would be like, but do pe people actually come to you with an image in their mind? Well, I think generally speaking, most people will, will say, I, I do not want to be in pain. Um, you, you know, I don't, I don't want to be uncomfortable. For, um, there are certainly people who want to um, find spiritual peace 
um, family piece, you know, emotional piece, whatever it is. And and I I think as people approach death, they probably they probably think more about those things. Would you agree, Nancy? Absolutely. And and as as they're starting to to think about those things, um, you know, they. They may not speak it, but somewhere in the heart, they know what they want. Okay, but so your family, I mean, family members, it must be even harder to deal with them in some respects, because obviously they don't want this person to die, mm -hmm. and they want them to be as lucid mm -hmm. as they go through the process as possible. I mean, mm -hmm. the, the, how do you deal with that? Well, uh, it's interesting, because there there is a, a, a real uh, focus from at, from Calvary to work with the patient and the family as a unit because there are dilemmas all along the way. People want people to be out of pain, yet they want them to be alert. Patients will want to uh, have options. They may not be the best choices that they have to make, but they still want to be able to have options. Um, I think it's important for whatever line of, of work we happen to be in, whether they're nurses, physicians, uh, pastoral care, individual social workers, that we support the patient and the family to help to make the best decisions at that point in time. And um, I think that one of the things that happens often is that patients and families will get way ahead of themselves. What's going to happen, uh, they'll start talking about things that are not going to happen right then and there. And I think that what's different about us is that we concentrate on what's going on right now. Um, and let's talk about what's going on right now with some preparation as we go forward. You talk about individuals not thinking about their death, and yet we do. When we hear of someone who has been in an ICU and maybe on a ventilator, or uh, and someone will say, I never want to be like that, or I, I want to try everything. So people at some level have some thoughts, particularly as we experience the love, uh, death of loved ones or friends or acquaintances. And there are some preconceived notions about what's going to happen at the end. We like to try and help people to support their choices. How does it, uh, in terms of having a patient uh, come to recognize, right, that it's time to go to Calvary, uh, I would think is has got to be tough, right, that this is the moment where I'm, I'm going into hospice. And uh, is that is there a sense of somehow that I'm not fighting anymore. I'm just a sort of resignation. Uh, what's, 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 what's behind? It seems like to me that the notion of someone were saying to me, you're going on hospice. You know, death is imminent. And, and that's a different reality. I, yeah, I think um, when, you, when you talk about Calvary, the hospital and, and the approach with palliative care, really what we're what we're looking to do is certainly to relieve somebody's suffering and, and help them be comfortable. Um, but our approach, not everybody, we're, you don't come to us necessarily because there's a death sentence, so to speak, and you hear that out there. We take care of people who have life-threatening illness. We acutely and aggressively manage their symptoms. So it, wouldn't, it would not be unusual for somebody who was at home, who had a great deal of pain or shortness of breath or whatever the case may be. And, you know, maybe Nancy's folks might say, well, you know, you need to go to the hospital. It wouldn't be unusual for somebody to come in for five days and, mm -hmm. and have us, um, you know, fix their symptoms and, and improve their quality of life. And then, yes, discharge them discharge them back. We've had many stories of how people have come in, they've been discharged, they've resumed their normal life as much as possible. Um, and have they gone on to live for a longer period? Long, no, because we, we, I, I think what's important to note here is, is, is this people have life-threatening illness. So the eventuality of, of their illness, whether it be cancer and stage heart disease, um, liver disease, whatever the case may be, the eventuality is that will happen, and we but will they be may there. Not, they probably won't survive, and we will be there for them again. Mm -hmm. And um, you have something called Calvary at Home. So, what are the origins of that? That's what you do, the hospice care. Right? That's correct. That's correct. Um, you know, Calvary as an organization began back in 1899, 
and as uh, we got into the, I guess, the 1970s, it was thought that perhaps in order to be able to give care to the patients that Patty was just talking about, who went home, that we should have a division of the hospital that um, took care of individuals at home. So back in uh, 1985, uh, they opened the home care, and back in 1998, the hospice at home came into existence. They're just two different um, insurance benefits. But uh, over the years, we have grown from uh, very, very small to more than 300 patients on a daily basis. Well, I want to talk to you a little bit about that. You just sure. mentioned the word insurance and cost. We'll talk about that in a minute. First, we're going to take a break. We'll continue this conversation in just a moment. Stay with us. Welcome back. Our topic today deals with dying and the many issues that we are faced with when a loved one nears the end of their life. And let's pick up where we left off. We were just about to talk about the costs of this kind of care that you have at Calvary Hospital. Is it covered by insurance for the most part? Yes, for the most part it is. Um, um, people who are Medicare, Medicaid beneficiaries certainly have a uh, benefit for hospice care and most um, private insurances also uh, have uh, a benefit that would enable people to have uh, quality end-of-life care. How have you seen over the past many years that you've been around the changes in how people are willing to approach the end of their life? Um, well, if talk a little bit about palliative care. Um, Which, by the way, what does that mean? Palliative care is, is an approach to care that um, actually runs, in modern days, today, runs concurrently with, with curative treatment. And it, it provides a supportive care. In other words, we're looking at anticipating and preventing suffering that might be caused either by treatments or the disease itself. So for instance, like chemotherapy. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. you're, you're working alongside to mm -hmm. whatever that is causing whatever the kind of symptoms or Correct. side effects. Exactly. Of that sort of nausea, thing. vomiting, perhaps um, some neurological pain that sometimes can go along with chemotherapy. Uh, the palliative portion is to address those symptoms. They're not going to uh, eliminate the disease, but they are going to help the person feel better. Mm. Right. Okay. And and in a, in a typical setting, palliative care can be done by your own your own physician or healthcare team. It's when it's when things become complex and complicated that it, specialists are called in to, to help with that process because, you know, as, as people's illnesses become more complex and, and they, their symptoms become more complex, you really need somebody to, to help you with that. What about the families of people who uh, are, have someone whom they love who is uh, on hospice? How you know because they're going to survive mm -hmm. after the patient uh, after the patient dies and what what about them I mean how do they because they they are they're left with this incredible gaping wound in their life there are lots of ways that uh, we we assist those who are bereaved and uh, Calvary the the hospice uh, program has a 13 month bereavement program that we uh, offer to all of the survivors, family as well as uh, close friends for individuals who for some people that is their family. Um, and it's a variety of different efforts, uh, materials, education materials, support groups uh, that are specific to that particular person's loss. But to maintain the connection, telephone calls and that kind of thing, helping people to get over the first year of the first birthday without the person, the first holiday, and then getting over that first anniversary. Um, but it's very important for us to remember that that's another group of our, our patient care that, that needs to be addressed even after that significant loss. So how does one come to Calvary? I mean, is it, is it open to anybody or do you have to have certain criteria? What's, how, do, how, does, how do people find out and, and really learn about this that are interested watching? Well, we are a tertiary care facility for the inpatient and I think that most um, of the hospitals and healthcare facilities in New York City certainly know well about Calvary. Um, physicians as well. Uh, but that being said, um, 
at any time, anybody can just give a call into Calvary's main number. Uh, there's always a nurse available to talk to somebody. Um, uh, and I always think that it's great if people can do that well ahead of time uh, so that they're not making decisions in the middle of a crisis. We also have a website uh, for Calvary Hospital that does give some information as well. So what criteria should people consider then when they're making this kind of a, of a, of a hospice decision? I think, um, well, there, there are two approaches. If, if you, there may be a person at home who um, does, not real, does not have the resources um, and, and being at home is now becoming overwhelming. Um, and they need support and they need help. Um, you know, we're certainly there for them. And like Nancy said, you would call the general number and our nurses would then assist you in, in deciding whether we would send hospice in home care or um, whether you needed to be admitted to the hospital. And you can self-refer to the hospital. That wouldn't be unusual. Well, so I guess, and we've just a short time left, but in today's world, this is not something that we want to face, but we have to make these kinds of decisions. And if you had any words of advice for people who know that they've got to deal with this, what would it be? I think we're, we're, we are a very special place. We are com so committed to, to making sure that that the person is not abandoned, that their suffering is alleviated, and, and that just all around that you're comfortable. And, and, that, that, and we're very committed to that, and that makes, that makes us a special place. And, and I think if there's any fears, you, you should just know that we are the place for you to be. Nancy? And I think it's important for individuals to take control of their situation. Try and find out as much information. Ask their health care providers about treatments that are available and what the outcomes of those treatments are. It's surprising that uh, very often when people will find out that another round of chemotherapy may extend their life another week, gee, maybe they might be making a different, different decision. So for individuals, for themselves or the, for their family members, to really know that they have choices right up until the very end. There are choices for everyone, and it's their life, and they're the ones who should be making those decisions. And I suspect that's about the hardest thing for people to understand, yes. that they really do have choices they about do. the way that way they die. Yes. Thank you both so much for being with us, Thank and I you. really appreciate the work that you do. I know it's got to be difficult, and yet, you said earlier that it brings you great joy. So thank you. Thank we appreciate you. it. When we come back, we'll be joined by our regular contributors, Elizabeth Scalia and Grant Galicia, and have some final thoughts about these end-of-life issues. Stay with us. Welcome back. Continuing our conversation on end-of-life issues, we are now joined by the show's regular contributors, Elizabeth Scalia, contributor of First Things and author of the blog, The Anchoress, and Grant Galicho, associate editor of Commonweal Magazine. So this must have been particularly poignant for you from Calvary Hospital because your brother was there. Yeah. And you've written this, you wrote this book, what, five, six years ago about caring for the dying? Uh, with the help of your Catholic faith. That's part of a series actually with um, our Sunday visitor has put out depression with the help of your Catholic faith and dealing with cancer. This one happened mm -hmm. to be uh, about my about caring for the dying because they had read about my brother. And but you talk about when he was, about the time he was going into hospice. He was saying, I want to be cremated and my ashes thrown off a mountain of Hawaii. And you guys are like, no, 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 how about Staten Island? We can't afford to fly or something. I mean, it was a joke. You were joking because you didn't want to face the you don't reality. You want to have that conversation. Those are really difficult conversations to have. And when you are in the thick of um, caring for someone, and the whole family was helping, um, you know, taking turns, working in shifts to try to help him and alleviate his pain, and we could never get a handle on the pain, and it was so exhausting. Um, the last thing you want to do then is have conversations like that. It, it, he may really want to talk about what he wants, but you can't process it. Um, going to hospice finally which was not an easy decision because it meant 
in, in our family, it really meant this is it. There's nothing more we can do. Mm -hmm. um, that resignation we were talking it about. Was, it was a very difficult. And, and I'll tell you what, I can remember the day we brought him there. My mother in, couldn't deal with it. She, uh, she couldn't be part of it at all. And I ended up running in the ambulance with my brother. And I said to him, your, your whole world has become this bedroom and the, the hit of pain medication. I said, when we get you in there, you're going to be able to be taken around in this very comfortable chair. There's an atrium. You can have a beer. I said, it's going to give you some freedom and mobility. And he just kind of looked at me and said, freedom and mobility, what concepts? Um, yeah. Because really, your world when you're dying becomes the end table and the, the, the TV and the bed, and, and that's it. Mm -hmm. Going into hospice gave us um, time to be free to be with each other and gave us quality time together and, and it was a hard beauty but it was very beautiful and the people at Calvary were phenomenal. They, they seem like they are. So Grant, when you think about this whole concept, you, you look at it from the ethics that are involved about how do you make those decisions? When, uh, when my grandmother was dying, I, I watched my father and his brother struggle with the decision to unplug her. Uh, she was on a ventilator. She had had a stroke. The doctors were saying it was very unlikely that she was going to be able to live without the assistance of the machine. And the hospital, which was a Lutheran hospital, brought in a very talented ethicist who had a real pastoral sense about her. Um, and they struggled through all of those questions. You know, are we guiding her to death? Are we assisting in her death? Are we willing her death? Um, and so after probably two weeks of wrestling with this, they finally decided to unplug her. And then she lived for another two months. Oh. <laughs> and it was just like, why did we struggle so long? You know, right. she, there, was still, there was still a lot of life left. She didn't, she didn't wake up, she didn't become conscious, but it was, it was sort of a fascinating kind of kick, you know? Uh, so they're, they're, these are really tangled ethical questions. I mean, clearly the, the issue that, that highlighted it, or the, the case that highlighted it was Terry Schiaffo, right? Sure. And uh, I think that that kind of put in, and, and I think there were a lot of very mixed emotions on every side. I mean, the fact is, is you know, we value life, we respect life. Here's a person in a persistent vegetative state. Even, you know, when we say that, even speaking about people as vegetables seems to be ridiculous, you know. But, but to use that, to be in that persistent vegetative state, I mean, what is it that we are, what is that person owed? And... Uh, and, you know, we can look at that case, and, and then, as you say, Grant, we look in our own circumstances, of our own family. You know, my grandmother was 104 when she was sick. She didn't want to eat anymore. You know, does that then require that we begin artificial nutrition and hydration? She doesn't want to. I mean, or is that just part of the process of the body shutting down for the person preparing for death? They're very, very difficult questions. They're very real questions. They're the questions that we all have to sort of struggle with. Do you have an image of how you will, how you want to die? with my rosary beads in my hand, crucifix on uh, <laughs> my side, but breviary I mean, red, all completed, nice confession before it. Yeah, that's the part. Hire a few keeners. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> but I mean, I, I honestly have never really dared to even think about that because it's too scary for me. You know, I'd, I've never thought about my death, but I, I remember when John Paul died, I thought it was an, an amazing asset, uh, lesson I'm sorry, I can't speak. An amazing lesson in the whole bioethic question because um, when it came to the point where it was silly to to keep feeding him, he said, "Don't keep feeding me. You know, so, just let this happen." And and there does have to be a point where you say, "You know, let it happen." But getting to that, knowing where that line is, is is what's so difficult. It's kind for of us. interesting when you think about how uh, how much time and energy. And the Holy Father had mentioned this on, on an Easter, in his Easter sermon, right? How much time and energy we put into prolonging life, keep mm -hmm. making sure that we continue to live. Uh, and yet, if we were to live forever, you know, how difficult would that be for all of us, right? It would be, it would be mm -hmm. terrible. My mom, so, she's, she's constantly saying, I hope I don't live too long. Yeah. Well, I mean, <laughs> well, there is a kind, because there is a kind of... You know what the expression is, is you know the, you know the person who wants to live to be 100? A person who's 99, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so, there's a little difference. I mean, you know, when is too long, too right. long? So we all kind of want, uh, we all kind of recognize that somehow death is not, I mean, for, for me, death is not scary at the moment. I don't mean but, it's scary, the, the idea of it. It's just thinking it through is what right. I choose not to think about. Well, who knows what's coming? Right. I mean, it's not, right. it's not, like, it's not like choosing a career. It, yeah. it, it chooses you, you know? 
Uh, it's more like a vocation, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, the other thing is, that, I mean, what, what, what are we hanging on to? You know, when, when we are clinging to life, what is it? I mean, as Christians, mm -hmm. that's something, I mean, that's something that I, I constantly think of. What, what, what are we hanging on to? If you're, not, if you're not allowing yourself to die, what are you, I mean, what are you afraid and yet, of? And yet, I mean, the scriptures make it really clear that life is a gift. And yes. so we're supposed to cherish life and want life and, and desire life. So, you know, on one level, we are prepared for the life which is to come. And we see that our life here, yet at the same time, this is a gift. And so we're supposed to cherish it and, and savor every last moment of it, but not recognize, you know, the key thing is, is we recognize that we're pilgrims here, that we're passing through. This is not where we've made our permanent home. Our life is in a life which is to come, but we're passing through and we should savor these moments. And do you have last thoughts for the people who are watching who may be experiencing what you experienced with your brother? Um, don't be afraid. I, I always seem to end with don't be afraid, but seriously, don't be afraid to invest in investigating uh, these end-of-life uh, programs that they have at Calvary. They really do follow up afterwards. Um, and, you know, a month after the death, they're, they're with you. And a year after the death, they're with you. They commit to really walking this hard road with you. And um, it frees you to really spend, we talk about quality time all the, all the time. This is a real quality oh. You Time. know, it's interesting, Elizabeth, this is, uh, you know, is this the, the, the phrase, be not afraid, right? And we, we look at that from the scriptures. But uh, something I'm always reminded of is that doesn't mean there's nothing to be afraid of. Right. And so you can say, be not afraid, but that doesn't mean there's nothing to be afraid of. I, I think that with, what afraid. be not afraid means is that the Lord is, he's with us. He's there and he's with you. Thank you all, Grant, Elizabeth, Monsignor, appreciate it. And thank all of you for being with us. Remember that you don't need a TV to watch the net. We are always on online at netny.net. For all of us here, I'm Jane Hansen. I'll see you next time in the arena.